We are going to read from Exodus 33. I'm going to preach from one of my favorite passages from the Bible, from the Old Testament. It's top three, top three, all right? Up there with the ending of Job. If you have half an hour and you want me to blow your mind about the ending of Job, I can do that. But we're going to, we're going to talk from uh, Exodus 33. So if you open up your Bibles, we'll start with Exodus 33, verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know your name. Then Moses said, show me your glory. (laughs) And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you and I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face. And then we see uh, later on in uh, Exodus 34, we see this scene where this promise comes to fruition. In Exodus 34, verse 5, it says, "Then Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there, with him and proclaimed his name the Lord and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord the Lord the compassionate and gracious slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished he punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and the fourth generation. All right, let's quickly pray. Dear Holy Spirit, we pray you would come, you would be with us, that you would start to knock on the doors of our heart, that you would start to plant the seed that would grow into fruit so that we can touch uh, this 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 suburb and this city and this nation. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would come and speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's not you, it's me? All right? It's not you, it's me. You, you know, if you're uh, trying to break up with someone and you're trying to let them down easy, you say, You know, it's not you, it's me. There's things in my life that I need to deal with. I'm not ready right now for a relationship. It's not you, it's me. Or have you ever been in an argument, uh, you know, like an argument with your spouse and, uh, you know, in, in my head I always think I'm right, right? You know, something's blown up at home and I always think I've acted rationally, I've acted maturely, I've acted uh, like an adult would act. And then as you come and you talk with your partner, you realise that you're the one that was, that's at fault, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden you realise, oh, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> the problem here, it's not you. you, you have done absolutely everything right. It's not you, it's me. Well, today I want to reverse this. I want to speak, it's not me, it's you. It's not me, it's you. 
You see, because one of the, the key characteristics, I think, of, of a mature Christian is actually their whole walk, their whole life isn't about them. It's not about them. It's about how do they serve others? How do they stand in the gap for others? How do they lead other people to maturity? Right. For a mature Christian, it's not about them. It's about others. Right. They've matured to a point in their Christian walk where they don't need to come to a, a, a Sunday morning service to be fed because they're feeding themselves every day. If I can, if I can fill you in on a little secret, church on a Sunday morning for me is not about me. It's about bringing my boys to Sunday school, right? It's about coming and worshipping God and then it's coming and about building other people up, right? It's actually not about me. Hey, it's great if I get something. It's great if I get an overflow, but it's not about me. It's about others. And today I want to speak about it's not me, it's you, all right? It's not me, it's you. And so we see in this passage a classic example of it's not me, it's you. You see, this, I love this passage because God is so raw. God is so real in this passage. He's not a robot. He's not acting by these r- rules. He's hurt. Right. He's hurt. And God is hurt because Moses has gone up to the mountain and while Moses is up on Mount Sinai and God and Moses are talking, the Israelites have gone and created a golden calf. And you remember the scene that Moses walks down with the Ten Commandments and he sees the golden calf and he throws it on the ground. And there is this big chasm, this big uh, now separation between Israel and God. And God is deeply hurt by what has just happened. You know, in, in, and then we see in Exodus uh, <clears throat> 32 verse 9, right, Exodus 32 verse 9, it says this, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. And I'll make you into a great nation. One of the things I teach my students is you've always got to look at the pronouns at what's happening here. God says to Moses, step aside, Moses, I'm going to burn them and I'm going to turn you into a nation. He says, I'm done with Israel. I'm just going to burn them all. But Moses, you are now Israel. And Moses is like, okay, calm down, calm down. I don't know why Moses, I'm like, if I was Moses, I'd be like, go ahead. They're just complaining all the time. (laughs) Right? And then in the start of Exodus 33, we see this. The Lord says to Moses, now Moses is being patient. He's, He's delaying. He's putting it off. He's like, let's not make a rash decision here. But then God says, then then Exodus 33 verse 1, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought out of Egypt. So God didn't bring them out of Egypt. Moses brought them out of Egypt. And go up to the land I promised you, uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I'll give it to your descendants. I'll send an angel before you and you'll drive out all these people. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey but I will not go with you because you are, excuse me, a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you along the way. (laughs) God is angry. (laughs) Are there any parents in this room where you're so angry with your child, you're like, your son has done this. It's not my son, your son. And we get this, this sense here that, God is saying, hey, I didn't bring them out. I don't want anything to do with them. The people that you brought out, notice the you, you, you. God is on the verge of completely disowning Israel because of the golden calf incident. It's tense. It's heated. It's emotional. 
And then we get to this, this, this moment in, later on in chapter 33, right, where Moses finally confronts God and there's this discussion. And God says to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then in verse 15, it says, then Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us from here. And you're like, Moses, don't you have your hearing aid on? He's just said he'll go with you. Why all of a sudden do you need to make this point? Again, trying to get, you know, God has already said I'm going to go with you. Now, one of the, the interesting things here is that um, in our English language, I can say you, Jake, singular, or I can say you, the church. We don't really talk about you all, do we? So what God says to Moses here is, I will go with you, singular. He's saying, I'm not going with the people. I'm going to go with you, Moses, right? But I'm not going with Israel. And so that's why Moses then turns around and says, no, you've got to come with us, plural, right? You've got to come with all of us, God. He's actually standing in the gap and not just saying, God, I need you with me. I need you with my whole family, with my whole nation, with all of these people, God. You can't just come with me, right? You're not actually angry with me. I was up on the mountain while they were building the calf, right? And so Moses here is standing in the gap for his people. Again, he's up on the mountain when they do this. He has absolutely no guilt at all in this situation. And yet Moses is willing to stand in the gap for his people, right? Because it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about me, it's about you. You know, I remember when I was single before I met Hannah, I bought a block of land and I, was, I had this great vision to be a sort of real estate mogul with all of these uh, investment properties and I'm like, okay, first step, buy a block of land, build a house. And I bought a block of land and I was trying to build this house as a single man and it just didn't, it wasn't working. I couldn't get the finance to get the, this house built. And then I met Hannah and we got married and even in, we had this block of land and we were paying interest on this block of land, but we couldn't get finance for it. It was like we were knocking and knocking on this door and it was always shut. And, you know, in that, it was about two years of our marriage before we were able to sell it. We put it on the market. It was on the market for like a year. It's just this ridiculously long, drawn-out process where we lost thousands and thousands of dollars. But you know what I love about my wife? She never once turned around and said, this was a property you bought when you were single and now my money is going to pay the interest on this property. Right? Because it's us. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about all of us. Right? And this is what we see in the Bible continually over and over again. The mature Israelites, right? the really good ones, stand in the gap. Daniel, I love Daniel's prayer in, uh, in Daniel 9. Right, he's done all these incredible things. He slept with lions. He's uh, gone and had this amazing fast. He's done all these incredible things. He's been holy and righteous and blameless before God. And then in chapter 9, he prays this prayer. And what he says is, he says, we have sinned. We, Israel, have sinned. Now, Daniel hasn't sinned at that point. He's been, he's, he's one of the good ones, right? He's righteous. But yet Daniel stands in the gap for his people, right? Daniel takes on the sin of his people, even though he wasn't a part of it. You following me here? It's not about me. It's about you. Likewise, Jesus, we can point to Jesus, right? Jesus becomes the very personification of Israel. He takes on Israel's sins. And what does Mark 10, 45 say? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. It's not about me. 
It's about you. Being mature in our walk with Christ, being mature means that it's not just about me, it's about you. It's not just about me and my walk and my experience with God. It's actually about how do I serve the, the new Christians? How do I serve those that are struggling in their faith? How do I serve those that are actually just struggling in life? Right. It's not about me, it's about you. And so I want to ask you, what situations in your life is God calling you to, scan, to stand in the gap for? What situations is God placing you in? And you're like, God, why are you putting me here? It's just yuck here. It's just doesn't make sense. I don't like it. It's not my fault. Maybe God's actually placing you there to stand in the gap. Maybe God's actually placing you there because he wants you to think about others, not just about yourself and your walk with him. You with me here? It's not just about me. It's about you. This is what I love about Moses, right? So we see Moses. He's taught God down from the ledge, right? God was willing to burn a million people. He's willing to burn the whole Israelite nation. And Moses talks him down from the ledge, right? They're back at square one. And you think, okay, Moses, quit while you're ahead, right? And what does Moses do? God, show me your glory. Now, the crazy thing is that no one else in the Old Testament asks God this. Abraham, right? Abraham had all these incredible promises. Abraham's the father of the faith. Abraham never says to God, show me your glory. Noah, you know, he has this big old boat ride with God. Never says, show me your glory. Joseph goes through years and years of hardship and eventually leads, gets to the second position in Egypt. Never says, show me your glory. David, Solomon, the prophets, none of them have ever said to God, show me your glory. And Moses has gone through this tense situation and then he comes to God and says, no, actually, I want more. No, actually... I want more. Show me your glory. You know, there's something childlike about Moses' relationship with God, right? That he can just go, okay, I've taught you down from the ledge. Okay, now show me your glory. I want more. I'm not satisfied with just getting back to square one. Actually, show me. Right. When did we grow up? When did we lose this childlike faith? If growing, me, growing up means that I don't ask God for more, I want to be childlike in my faith. <clears throat> I don't want to just accept the position that God's put me in. I actually want more. You know, I remember, um, you know, part of my story is that God called me to be a teacher and there wasn't any job. And, you know, I did year after year of a PhD with no position at the end. And then finally, <clears throat> about... Two or three months before my PhD ended up, before I was going to finish my PhD, a position opened up here at Alpha Crucis. And it was this incredible long walk of faith for year after year after year that me and my wife went through. And I remember finally getting into that position. And as clear as day, God said, don't settle. Don't settle. You've got your dream job, don't you dare settle. Don't you dare stop asking me for more. Don't you dare just settle into where you are. You know, I think there's something about wanting more in God. You know, that's part of why I started a YouTube channel. I just want more, right? I, got, I, want, I want another walk of faith like that one before. I want to do more and more for God. I want to just settle for the people that can come into my classroom. I want to reach people all around the world. Are you with me? It's not about me. It's about you, and you see the thing about this, right? The thing about this request is that it actually touches the, the generations. Because Moses asks for more, he actually sets up a pillar for generation after generation after generation. <coughs> 
You, can, you see, because if you start reading the Bible from page one, Genesis 1, and you, with the question in mind, what is God like? You can discern a few different things. You can look at the way that God acts and you can think, okay, this is what God is like. Or you can look at the names given to God and you think, okay, God is a saviour, a healer, all-powerful. But actually, Exodus 34 is the first time in the history of Israel where God describes himself. Right? It's the first time. If you start reading from Genesis chronologically, this is the first time that God actually describes who he is. It's called the self-revelation of God, right? that he's compassionate, gracious, faithful, abounding in love, maintaining love to thousands. Right? This is the first time that God opens himself up and reveals his nature. You with me here? Because Moses asks for more, he gets more. He gets a clearer understanding of who God is. He gets something that Abraham never saw. He gets something that Noah never saw. He gets something that Joseph never saw. And this plants a stake in the ground. This is a pillar for generation after generation. When they're in despair, when they're destitute, when they're sitting there thinking, has God completely abandoned us? They look back to this passage. And this is the rock on which they base their hopes for God's restoration. Can I give you a couple of examples? Micah. Micah 7, verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> if I can have that up. Micah has just delivered this incredible judgment on the people. And so Micah is left thinking, is God just going to abandon them? Because they don't seem like they're repenting. Micah says this, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? Who does not stay angry forever, but delights in showing mercy? All right? Micah is at this point where he's asking, is God just going to completely abandon us? And then he points back to what? Moses' self-revelation. God's self-revelation to Moses. Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah is at a place where they've rebuilt the temple and it's not as good as before and the Shekinah glory hasn't come back. And he's sitting there, he's wondering, has God completely abandoned us? Nehemiah 9, 16 and 17 says this, but they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked. They did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. We see in Noah 4 he uses this for the nations, right? The reason why Noah doesn't want to go to Nineveh is because he knows God is abounding in love, slow to anger, faithful, and over and over again, you know, there is this, there is this, sorry, it was Noah, not Noah, Jonah, sorry, Jonah 4, not Noah. And then Psalms 145 takes this even further and says, this is God's attitude towards the whole creation. Do you see what happens here when, when Moses steps out and says, God, I want more? Moses actually sets up something for the generations. Because it's not about me, it's about you. And that could be negative. It means that we stand in the gap for other people, but it can also be positive. We actually press into God so much that it's not about me, it's about the generations that come after me. You with me here? I'll, I'll finish with this story and then I'll conclude. You know, I remember <clears throat> when I was a, a young boy, my dad brought me to Planet Shakers. And this was back in the day when it was like 500 people, you know, in the, you know, the Paradise Auditorium. They weren't even filling the, 
the stand. It was just on, on the ground. And I was 11 years old. And you had to be 13 to go to Planet Shakers. And I watched my dad, who was an ACC credentialed minister, outright lie about my age. And this wasn't just like a once-off. This was two years in a row he lied about how old I was because he wanted to get me into that room. My dad actually took three or four days off work and took me and my brother to those early Planet Shakers meetings because it wasn't about him. It was about me and my, son, my brother. All right. And I remember being in those meetings some of the first times where I really felt that transforming presence of God, I was standing next to my dad in those early Planet Shakers meetings. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about the generations. You know, my dad realized that it wasn't about him. It's about us. You know, I was even just sitting there today and watching our church news and at the back of uh, when that young bloke was speaking, the words there were, what were the words? Legacy. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about the legacy. Right. And that legacy can be financial, yes, but it can also be spiritual. Right. What is the spiritual legacy that you're handing on to your kids? that you're handing on to your nephews and nieces, that you're handing on to the generation after generation. Right. Because it's not about me. It's about you. I want to just close with this, with this question. Oh, why does God speak to Moses like this? Why does God open himself up to Moses? Why does God choose Moses? Why does God open himself up and reveal himself to Moses more than almost any other person in the Old Testament? And I wonder actually whether it's because Moses stands in the gap that he actually is, God, he actually is godly. He's actually showing something of the love of God. And, and the love of God isn't just this cuddly little thing we have in our heart or this nice little feeling or this systematic statement of the love of God. Love of God is an action and Moses stands in the gap and he creates a legacy for generations. So my question here to you is, what legacy are you leaving behind? How are you not only leaving a, a, a physical legacy, but a spiritual one. 